Sweet Land of Liberty of the 19th Century brings you the most memorable moments in America's history. In this program, you'll learn about the Louisiana Purchase, America's Industrial Revolution, the Battle for Texas, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the Great Westward Expansion, and Immigration and the Gilded Age. Like the house of a young and growing family, the country of the United States found itself expanding by leaps and bounds by the year of 1800. When the original 13 colonies created the country in 1776, the estimated population was a little more than 2.7 million Americans. By 1800, only four more states had been added, but the population number had nearly doubled to 5.3 million. It was clear that more room was needed. At that time, much of the land in North America was controlled by several European countries. Spain held the area that would eventually become Florida, as well as much of the South and West. The Oregon country was jointly occupied by Brits and French Canadians. The rest of the vast land was under the domain of soldier, leader, and soon-to-be Emperor of France, Napoleon Bonaparte. The land was known as the Louisiana Territory so-called for France's King Louis XIV. Just as important as the land itself was the port of New Orleans. Located at the mouth of the Mississippi River, it was the gateway to rivers and waterways that stretched far into the center of the land. Although France had given New Orleans to Spain in 1762, it was returned by a secret treaty in 1801. U.S. President Thomas Jefferson knew how essential the Louisiana Territory would be to the growth of America. At the same time, Napoleon needed money to support his desire to dominate Europe and offered to sell the Louisiana Territory to the United States. Jefferson sent James Monroe and Robert R. Livingston to Paris to negotiate the deal, and when it was all over, America had doubled its size and got the port of New Orleans that was so badly needed. Having the port of New Orleans and the Mississippi River meant that farmers would have access to fertile and productive farmland that spread across the plains in the Louisiana Territory. What's more, once the crops were grown and harvested, the river would provide the means of transporting those goods to New Orleans and out to market. The land would be a treasure chest of natural resources as well, rich with ores, minerals, and precious metals like gold and silver. There were forests with lumber for construction and grazing fields for cattle and sheep. It was a deal that had seldom been seen in the history of the world. There was one problem with the potential transaction. The U.S. Constitution had no rules that covered acquiring new territory. Jefferson, a man who believed in sticking closely to the set of laws that had been established, wasn't even sure that the purchase would be legal but he also recognized how important the Louisiana Purchase would be for the country and its future. After some debate, Congress approved the deal. The Louisiana Purchase, signed on April 30, 1803, cost $15 million. The land totaled more than 828,000 square miles, making the deal of steel at under three cents an acre. That purchase in today's money would be equal to more than a quarter of a billion dollars. The boundaries of the acquisition reached from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border. Adding the vast area also put Jefferson and America a large step closer to reaching the Pacific Ocean. Jefferson was anxious to know all he could about this new land. He arranged for three separate groups to explore the area the Lewis and Clark Expedition in 1804, the Red River Expedition, and the Pike Expedition, both in 1806. The explorations returned with valuable knowledge of the geography of the land, as well as economic and trade information. Contact was also made with the many tribes of Native Americans that inhabited the regions. The purchase of the Louisiana Territory led to the eventual addition of all or parts of 15 new states to America. It was a move that placed the country squarely in the center of world affairs. 
which had been dominated by Europe for many centuries. It also started the westward expansion that continued throughout the 1800s. One negative result was the displacement and relocation of Native Americans across the South, the Plains, and other parts of the expanding country. Founding fathers regarded it as necessary for the growth of the nation. Native Americans regarded it as something less than proper. Still, the Louisiana Purchase was the single greatest land deal in American history, doubling the size of the United States and positioning it for further greatness. The century of the 1800s in America was witness to an explosive growth of industries and technologies, helping the young country quickly develop into a major power in the world. Clearly influenced and aided by inventions and processes that originated in Europe, specifically the former mother country of England, the United States relied on its own ingenuity and resources to expand their economy, business, and technology. The rapid change from homegrown goods, like fabrics for clothing and lumber to build lodging and furniture, to machines and factories, was known as the Industrial Revolution. England and Europe had theirs in the late 1700s, with spinning and weaving machinery to produce textiles powered by running water, then steam. But the British government refused to export these machines to America and they prevented those skilled in running them from emigrating to the young country. Still, some who knew all about the machinery made their way to America. One such person was Samuel Slater, who built a spinning mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 1790. It was the first real factory in the United States. With plenty of rivers and streams in New England, it took little time for the textile industry to develop and take hold there. One of America's first great inventors was Eli Whitney. A very bright lad, he had invented a nail-making machine by the age of 14. A graduate of Yale University, he moved to a Georgia plantation in 1793. He noticed it took hours and hours to clean seeds from cotton plants, and within two weeks of arriving at the plantation, he invented a machine that quickly separated the cotton fibers from the seeds. The cotton engine, or gin for short, could clean in one hour what it took many workers a whole day to do by hand. The invention may have been the single most important factor in making rich people out of many plantation owners in the South. As American factories grew, it was necessary to have an efficient way of transporting raw materials to them and transporting the finished products to markets. The natural system of rivers and waterways were the only real way to go. In stepped Robert Fulton, who, in 1807, hitched an English-built steam engine to some paddle wheels and invented the steamboat called the Claremont. In no time, steamboats were making pickups and deliveries to and from businesses all along the east and south. At the same time, companies started to build short roads of crushed rock called turnpikes, between some cities. The first federally funded road, called the National Road or the Cumberland Road, or the Main Street of America, was started in 1811. The first 140 miles connected Cumberland, Maryland, and Wheeling, Virginia, by 1818. Some areas charged a fee to travel the road, and the toll road in America was born. An amazing marvel of engineering, the Erie Canal connected the Hudson River near Albany, New York, with Lake Erie at Buffalo, New York, essentially creating a direct pathway between New York and Chicago, both quickly becoming major cities. The canal was more than 360 miles long, 4 feet deep and 40 feet across. Using more than 80 locks, it adjusted for the rise of 560 feet between Albany and Buffalo. The Erie Canal prompted the construction of many more similar waterways across the growing country. Of course, many parts of the country did not have suitable waterways, 
so another means of transportation was needed. The steam locomotive was invented by Englishman George Stevenson in 1814, and several American builders had worked to develop their own railway engines and tracks in the decade that followed. The Delaware and Hudson Company produced the Stour Bridge Lion in 1828, America's first steam locomotive. The growth of railroads in the United States was explosive, as operating lines like the Baltimore and Ohio, Mohawk and Hudson, and the Boston and Providence began to lay hundreds of miles of iron track between cities and businesses. By 1840, the railroad had replaced the canals as America's primary form of transportation. Many farmers in the country grew grains like wheat, corn, barley, oats, and rye. Their process of harvesting the fields was tedious and time-consuming. The crops had to be cut, collected, and baled, all by hand. Then came a young man named Cyrus McCormick. At the age of 15, the son of a Virginia farmer had already invented a cradle for carting the harvested grain. In 1831, at age 22, McCormick invented a horse-drawn reaper that would automatically cut and thresh the grain crops. Although the machine took about 10 years to catch on with American farmers, it revolutionized the way crops were collected and greatly improved food production for the entire world. But before the crops could be harvested, they had to be first planted. The soil could be dry or dense, and tough to get the seeds into the ground. Tilling the soil, the process of softening it by turning it over, had been done for thousands of years. The plow, made from wood or iron, was usually pulled by oxen or horses. It was a difficult job, and someone needed to make a better plow. That someone was John Deere, a blacksmith in a little town west of Chicago. In 1838, he took a broken steel saw blade and turned it into a steel plow. Sod and soil didn't stick to the shiny blade, allowing farmers to prepare their fields in much less time than it used to take. Within five years, Deere was selling more than a plow a day, long before the days of catalog sales and retail stores. The concept of long-distance communication was essentially limited to carrier pigeons and horseback riders, until Samuel Morse invented the telegraph. A gifted portrait artist, Morse developed a complete system of sending and receiving a code of electrical impulses along wires strung between two locations. In 1844, he set up telegraph wires funded by Congress and sent a test message from the Bible, What Hath God Wrought? The pulses traveled 40 miles between the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and were punched into a series of dots and dashes on paper tape. By the early 1850s, telegraph companies began sprouting up from the East Coast to the Mississippi River. A company called Western Union built the first coast-to-coast -coast telegraph line in 1861, and essentially ended the Pony Express. The first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid between Newfoundland and Canada and Ireland in 1858. A message that used to take ten days to travel between North America and Europe now just took a few minutes. The discovery of the rubber tree in South America in the 1700s led to a new industry in America in the 1820s, as companies began to make rubber shoes and waterproof clothing. But the success was short-lived, as it turned out that the rubber froze solid in the winter cold and melted into useless goo in the summer heat. A man named Charles Goodyear was intrigued by the problem and knew something could be done to make the rubber useful and long-lasting. But the man was broke. He was even thrown in jail in Philadelphia in 1834 for money he owed but couldn't pay. Still, he began experiments with raw rubber in his cell that eventually led to a solution. In 1839, Goodyear found a combination of adding sulfur and heat to rubber made the material temperature-stable, long-lasting, but still flexible and waterproof. 
The process eventually became known as vulcanization. It's still basically done the same way today, more than 150 years after its patent. Clothes were handmade for years, often taking hours or days to stitch just one garment. Elias Howe was not the first person to invent the sewing machine, but he was the first to create a reliable machine that solved many mechanical problems found in the previous machines. As someone born with a physical challenge, Howe was often unemployed and noticed how difficult it was for his young wife to complete the sewing she took in as odd jobs. At age 26 in 1845, Howe completed his first machine, but it was his second that earned him a patent in the following year. Yet America was unsure of his machine's ability, so he moved to England to sell sewing machines. While he was gone, other companies began to make machines based on his design. Returning to America, Howe won a lawsuit against Isaac Singer, and eventually earned millions in licensing from other manufacturers of sewing machines. The sewing machine had a huge impact on America's ability to make clothing and other stitched products in little time. An apron that took nearly an hour and a half to make by hand took only nine minutes by machine. A shirt that took 14 and a half hours to sew manually could be completed by a machine in just over one hour. Much of the Industrial Revolution, in terms of manufacturing, transportation, and processing food and raw materials, was centered in the North, and partly contributed to their winning the Civil War. Their dominance in manufacturing and other fields overpowered the South's reliance on farming and agriculture. After the war, a renewed revolution in technology and commerce spread across America, allowing the entire country to benefit from the progress as the 20th century was approaching. Much of early American history seems to focus on the East Coast and its 13 colonies, which became the first of the United States. But early settlers explored and developed other areas of the country as well. The vast land that eventually became the state of Texas is one of those areas, with a story that is as long and unique as one might imagine. At one time or another in the last 500 years, Texas has flown six different flags on its soil. Way back in 1519, a daring Spanish explorer named Alonso Alvarez de Pineda sailed from a port in Jamaica into the Gulf of Mexico. His travels led to the first mapping of the Texas coastline, although he stayed too long and was killed by the local Hoastec Indians. Another Spanish explorer, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, searched for the mythical seven cities of Cibola in 1540. Supposedly, they contained vast riches of gold and other treasures. During his travels, Coronado crossed into uncharted territory, where he found what would eventually become the North Panhandle of Texas. But no gold. In 1685, a Frenchman named René Robert Cavalier Sieur de la Salle sailed from France, with intentions of claiming the Mississippi River and surrounding lands in the name of King Louis the Fourteenth, But his faulty sense of direction led him to Matagorda Bay and the Brazos River. Once there, he built Fort St. Louis. His men weren't too pleased with his navigation, and de la Salle was killed in a mutiny two years later. But Spain continued its hold on the land, establishing Catholic missions in the Texas area across the 1700s, along with towns like San Antonio and Nacogdoches. Later, in 1800, Spain would give parts of Texas to France in a secret treaty, and France sold that land to the United States as part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, ending France's claim to Texas territory. In 1821, Mexico declared its independence from Spain and, in doing so, took Texas with it. Two years later, a man from Virginia named Stephen Austin convinced the Mexican government to allow American citizens to begin settling in Texas. 
The land would be theirs to develop if they were loyal to the Mexican government, learned to speak Spanish, and converted to the Catholic religion, an arrangement that didn't last very long. By 1830, Mexico became very unhappy with the large numbers of Americans settling in the land of Texas. They ordered that no more be allowed to emigrate, closing the Texan borders to American colonials. Those who lived there wanted to become a separate state, independent of Mexico and the U.S. In 1836, the Republic of Texas was formed, but not without costly losses. A two-week standoff at a small fort called the Alamo in San Antonio resulted in a bloody battle and the massacre of over 100 Texans by 1,500 Mexican soldiers. Mexican military leader Lopez de Santa Anna led the attack, and among those killed were famous American frontiersmen Jim Bowie and Davy Crockett. One month later, the Battle of San Jacinto established a solid victory for the Texans. Sam Houston led his troops against Santa Ana, capturing the general in defeat. Texans showed their appreciation and trust in Houston by electing him president of the republic. The United States was torn on whether they wanted Texas in the Union or not. Outgoing President Andrew Jackson was in favor of adding Texas as a state, but his successor, Martin Van Buren, opposed the idea. Those in Texas were anxious to belong to some country other than Mexico, even talking at one point with Great Britain about becoming part of their commonwealth. Conflict with Mexico continued, largely because of arguments over boundaries between the lands, even threatening war. By 1844, U.S. President John Tyler negotiated the annexation of Texas into the Union, a deal that didn't sit well with the Mexican government who cut off all contact with America at that point. Texas became America's 28th state in December of 1845. President of the Republic, Sam Houston, became a U.S. senator and later governor of the state. Border disagreements eventually led to the U.S. declaring war on Mexico in May of 1846. American soldiers captured Mexico City in September of 1847 and... Within six months, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed. The Mexican-American War came to an end, with the Rio Grande River established as the southern border of Texas. Texas joined the Union as a slave state, so when the American Civil War began in 1861, it became part of the Confederate States of America. More than 90,000 Texans served the Confederacy although more than 2,000 Texans joined the Union Army of the North. Many Texans were relieved when Lee surrendered to Grant in 1865, ending the Civil War and reuniting their land with the United States of America. In the midst of the 19th century, the Civil War thundered across America. Eleven southern states had several points of disagreement with the federal government in Washington, D.C., including their desire to exist as a loose confederation of states as opposed to a single nation and their right to own slaves as property. If the South won the war, the country would be a group of neighboring individual states, one having little in common with the next. If the North won, America would truly be the United States. By the summer of 1863, the war between the states had been raging for more than two years. Confederate General Robert E. Lee led his Army of Northern Virginia in a major attack on the northern states, with the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania becoming the site of a key battle. Major General George Gordon Meade Having just relieved Major General Joseph Hooker of his command of the Army of the Potomac, and, under the orders of President Abraham Lincoln, fought to keep Lee and his troops from moving through Pennsylvania and on into the north. Despite skirmishes that favored both sides, Union troops were eventually successful in forcing Lee and his men to retreat with great casualties. In the three days of July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 
The area in and around Gettysburg became the site of one of the bloodiest battles in the U.S. Civil War. More than 10,000 soldiers from the North and South were killed, 30,000 were wounded, and another 10,000 were missing or taken prisoner in this Battle of Gettysburg. More than 30,000 dead and wounded soldiers were left on the battlefields. Four months later, on November 19, 1863, the Soldiers' National Cemetery was dedicated at Gettysburg. It was the final resting place for 3,500 Union soldiers, with 3,200 Confederate soldiers relocated to cemeteries in the South after the war. The solemn ceremony featured a speech by politician and public speaker Edward Everett. He addressed the crowd of 15,000 for more than two hours. Then President Lincoln stepped to the podium. Four score and seven years ago... A score is 20 years, so Lincoln was referring to 87 years back, when the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty. Our ancestors had left England and came to North America to start a new country based on freedom and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. This new country wanted to avoid religious conflicts and slavery. Now we are engaged in a great civil war. That country is now at war with itself. Testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure fighting to determine if any nation built on the idea of freedom can survive. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. This area is the scene of the Battle of Gettysburg. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. This area will become a cemetery for soldiers who died for what they believed in. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. There is no question that this is the right thing to do. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. Looking at the big picture, the group gathered today has no right to make this land special. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it. Far above our poor power to add or detract. Those who fought and died here have made the area special, more than we ever could. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Lincoln was wrong and right here. The Gettysburg Address became his most famous speech, and the Battle of Gettysburg was a turning point for the war, which led to the reunification of the United States. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, it is up to the rest of the country to finish the job of rebuilding our nation. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Those who died here should inspire us to continue and complete their work to save the Union that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. We hope that these soldiers did not die for no good reason. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth.
that the United States of America, supported by a government of its citizens, will not dissolve and cease to exist. In contrast to Everett's two-hour speech, Lincoln spoke for just over two minutes. The next day, newspapers across the country printed the Gettysburg Address, with reactions based mostly on which political party the publications supported. Republican papers praised the eloquence of Lincoln's words. Democratic papers poked fun at the president for the shortness of his speech. No matter, those words would become known around the world, and they would be carved into a wall of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Even though the Civil War continued for another year and a half, the Battle of Gettysburg was considered by many to be the turning point. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address supported the hopes that the outcome would secure the concepts of freedom and equality in the United States of America. When Americans realized there was a vast expanse of land that stretched out from their settlements in cities in the East and Midwest, the move westward was bound to happen. Imagine moving into a new house, only to find you could only occupy one room. You'd probably want the entire house as yours. Of course, if there were others living there already, you would want them to join you, or move them out of the way. Fair or not, that's kind of what happened with westward expansion. It was called Manifest Destiny, the belief that Americans were a special group of people and had the right to claim the entire sum of land from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans. A newspaper man named John O'Sullivan coined the phrase in 1845, pointing to events like the Louisiana Purchase, the War with Mexico, and acquiring the Oregon Territory as proof of Manifest Destiny. It was said that freedom and liberty things not really seen in other parts of the world, were the basics of democracy, and it was up to America to prove it could work. While much of America embraced the idea of manifest destiny, others felt it was not right to force Native Americans and others to move from their lands. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 had given President Andrew Jackson the power to make treaties with the five civilized tribes, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, Seminole, and Cherokee nations throughout the South. They were relocated to land reserved in what would become the state of Oklahoma, an action that would become known as the Trail of Tears. America would continue its move toward the West. Another brick in the foundation of westward expansion and manifest destiny was the Monroe Doctrine. A doctrine is a statement of ideas or beliefs. In 1823, President James Monroe said that America's foreign policy would be clear. North and South America, identified as the Western Hemisphere, were to be left alone by Europe and other countries in the world. The Western Hemisphere was not to be colonized, and Europe was not to interfere with events in North or South America. The result of the Monroe Doctrine helped to further establish America's independence and also improve relationships with countries to the south of the United States. There were other reasons to move west toward the Pacific Ocean. In 1848, gold was found at Sutter's Mill in central California, and the news of the discovery spread quickly across the country. Folks from all over dreamed of striking it rich and rushed to the area, using the Oregon Trail and other established routes. They pitched tents along the rivers, panning for tiny specks of what might be gold. One prospector found anywhere from 80 to $110 of gold a week, worth 20 times as much today. Others weren't quite as lucky, and the gold on the surface was all taken in a few years. Miners started to dig into the ground for more gold, tearing up much of the landscape. Later rushes for gold and silver included the 1859 and 1879 Colorado strikes, the 1859 Comstock load in Nevada, the 1866 Utah strike, and the Canadian Klondike strike in 1896. Many people moved west when the Homestead Act was placed into law. Signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862, 
settlers were allowed to receive 160 acres of land for free if they lived on it for five years. They also had to build a house and farm the land for that period of time. But less than 20% of the Homestead Act land actually went to homesteaders, with a lot of the land taken by cattlemen, miners, and the railroads. The area in the West is often called wild, and probably for good reason. As new land became settled, there were seldom any local laws or official government to protect the citizens. Only the sheriff or marshal, chosen by the folks of the area, was empowered to appoint deputies in an effort to keep people safe from outlaws or bandits. It was common for men to carry guns, strapped to their hips in holsters, since there was no regular police to provide protection. Gunfire in the streets was common, although not as common as television or movies would lead us to believe. Still, one of the biggest of those conflicts, the gunfight at the O.K. Corral, is a prime example of what could happen when the laws were ignored. Five outlaws, Billy Claiborne, brothers Ike and Billy Clanton, and brothers Tom and Frank McClory, were thieves, stealing cattle and horses from local settlers in the town of Tombstone, in the Arizona Territory in 1881. The town marshal was Virgil Earp, along with deputized brothers Morgan and Wyatt, as well as Doc Holliday. Actually, he was a dentist and a gambler. The fight broke out when the marshal and deputies attempted to enforce a recently enacted law requiring that all weapons be surrendered while in the town of Tombstone. The outlaws refused to give up their guns, and the gunfight actually down the alley from the back of the O.K. Corral, broke out one fall afternoon. When it was over, the McClory brothers and Billy Clanton were dead, while Billy Claiborne and Ike Clanton ran away without injury. Virgil and Morgan Earp were wounded, and Doc Holliday was bruised by a stray bullet. In the 1890s, it was clear that the wilderness in the American West had come to a close. It was estimated that the population of wild buffalo in the western plains once more than 20 million strong, had been reduced to less than 2,000. With so much land settled from ocean to ocean, the westward expansion, backed by manifest destiny, was complete. With America going through the healing process it needed to recover from the Civil War, the country began to see some real advances in everything from population to politics and immigration to economics. But that expansion didn't happen without experiencing some serious growing pains. American writer and humorist Mark Twain noted that the country was having dire economic and social issues. In 1873, he referred to the period of time between then and the coming end of the 19th century as the Gilded Age. It was a clever play on the phrase the Golden Age, but Twain's satiric view called it gilded, in part saying, The golden gleam of the gilded surface hides the cheapness of the metal underneath. He feared America's economic and cultural advances were only symbolically covered with gold, concealing the tarnish and rust of greed, graft, and misuse of public trust and money. The period started off with a positive note as the first transcontinental railroad was completed. While the eastern half of the nation had a well-developed network of rail lines, nothing had been built past Council Bluffs, Iowa. Moving from there, the Central Pacific Railroad built west, and the Union Pacific Railroad built east from Sacramento, California. On May 10, 1869, after six years of construction, the two railroads met in Promontory, Utah. A golden spike was driven to honor the accomplishment. It was an important connection for the country, allowing travel from nearly coast to coast for the first time. But it would also reveal an ugly side note a few years later. In 1872, a congressional investigation revealed what was known as the Credit Mobilier Scandal. The U.S. government had agreed to help pay for the Union Pacific portion of the Transcontinental Railroad. An executive of the Union Pacific, Thomas C. Durant, started a company called Credit Mobilier to build the railroad with the government money. 
So when the Union Pacific made a contract with Credit Mobilier, it was secretly making a deal to pay itself. Put simply, Credit Mobilier was paid $72 million in contracts with government money. But the railroad that it built cost only $52 million. Worse, members of Congress and even Vice President Schuyler Colfax and future President James Garfield were suspected of being involved in the scandal as Credit Mobilier stockholders. It was a sad example of how some people in power have a need for greed. Another story of ugly politics in the early 1870s involved a New York City politician named William Tweed, although everyone called him Boss Tweed. He controlled a huge political machine, an organization of people and businesses that helped themselves to money and perks, as well as helping the city they served. Called Tammany Hall, this machine unfairly awarded high-level jobs to Tweed's supporters, as well as putting millions and millions of dollars in Tweed's pockets. When he was caught in 1873, he was sentenced to jail. Tweed managed to escape to Spain, but he was recaptured and died in a New York City jail in 1878. A businessman named John D. Rockefeller started the Standard Oil Company and Trust in 1870. In just 12 years, Rockefeller had assembled a business monopoly, owning more than 90% of the oil industry in America. In a similar fashion, Andrew Carnegie built his steel business into an empire. By the late 1880s, most of the steel made in America came from Carnegie's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania mills. Both Rockefeller and Carnegie were among America's richest men. In 1890, a U.S. senator named John Sherman noticed that such dominance by one company in one industry seemed unfair, preventing competition, and oftentimes leading to higher prices. Under his direction, Congress passed the Sherman Antitrust Act. It allowed the government to break up any business monopolies, keeping the prices for consumers low by encouraging competition. This is not to say that Rockefeller and Carnegie were bad or selfish people. In fact, they gave away much of their fortunes. For example, Rockefeller donated more than half a billion dollars for educational and religious uses, including starting the University of Chicago and the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, which is now Rockefeller University. Similarly, Carnegie donated millions to start more than 2,500 libraries around the world. He also gave millions of dollars for education, including funding Carnegie Mellon University and Tuskegee Institute. Much of America's explosive growth during that time can be attributed to the vast numbers of immigrants that came from Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. In 1880, the total population of America was around 50 million. Of those people, more than 6.5 million, 13%, were foreign-born. A large number of those immigrants were Chinese, many coming over to help the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Despite their hard work, the Chinese were singled out for harassment and bullying. In 1871, up to 20 Chinese immigrants were killed by lynch mobs in Los Angeles. Later in the decade, negative opinion against low-wage Chinese labor was so high in California, a clause was placed into their constitution which forbid employment of any Chinese workers. In 1882, the U.S. Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited the immigration of Chinese workers into the country. For the first time, America officially discriminated against an ethnic group for labor reasons. The law would stay in effect until the 1920s. Congress also moved to limit immigration on a selective basis, barring poor people, convicts, and the insane. But the issue of labor and workers' rights went much farther than just one ethnic group. With such massive growth in business and industry, rich owners were able to keep a tight control over their employees. The bosses paid them whatever they wanted to pay them, made them work whenever and as long as they wanted. Trade and craft people who made products like shoes and clothing, as well as those who performed services like mechanics and typesetters, had been organized into unions for many years. But as local groups, they had very little power against their bosses for things like wages and decent working conditions. They could stop working and go on strike, 
but the owners would just bring in more people to do the work. In the early 1880s, a cigar maker in New York named Samuel Gompers formed the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, which became the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, in 1886. The national organization represented the interests of iron workers, glass makers, carpenters, cigar rollers, skilled workers of all kinds. Now there was a power at a nationwide level to seek things like reasonable wages and an eight-hour workday. Coining the phrase, in union there is strength, Gompers would remain president of the AFL for almost 40 years. As America neared the 20th century, the Gilded Age gave way to reform and good changes. In building the country, no one ever said it would be easy. But aiming for a sense of fairness and right continued to keep the United States on a proper course for greatness.